Hey guys, welcome to chapter 18 and, and topic 1. This chapter we have three topics. In this first topic we're going to talk about the cell cycle and how it is controlled. And then we're going to proceed into talking about the cell cycle and then we'll wrap up the topic with one last topic. One, we'll wrap up the chapter with one last topic. Alright, so for this topic we're going to talk about the importance of the cell cycle. We're going to, re we're going to do a broad overview but then we'll dive into the M phase specifically in its own topic, and then we're going to talk about the control of the cell cycle, CDKs, and control of CDKs. As always, here's our objectives for this chapter, or for this topic. If you have any questions about these objectives, please let me know so that we can talk about them in class. So now let's move on to the importance of the cell cycle. So the cell cycle is really important for cells because it has a lot of properties going on in it. And we're going to talk about them all, but you should uh, you should be fairly familiar with the cell cycle because you've seen it in multiple other classes. But the cell cycle is very, very intricate and it's got a whole lot of coordinated events. And so it's really, really important that the cell be able to undergo this process quickly easily and clearly and have all these events happen properly. It's also really important that the cells undergo the cell cycle because it ensures that cells maintain their size, the number of organelles present, and their genetic information. And so that's another aspect of why it needs to happen. So we have why it's so important and it's so coordinated, but why it has to happen as well. Because this keeps the cells balanced. And then in a multicellular organism, it's really important that we have the same number of cells all the time so that we replace the cells that are undergoing apoptosis, which we'll talk about in topic number three. Alright, so let's review the cell cycle. There are two phases in the cell cycle. There's the M phase and there's interphase. And we break these phases into four different phases. Interphase is the longest phase. Most cells are in interphase for a majority of their lifetime. The three phases in interphase are G1, S, and G2. The M phase is where we find mitosis and cytokinesis. And we're going to talk about each of these here in just a second on the next couple slides. So the G phases, I just grouped them together because they're very similar. So they st G stands for gap phase, and G1 ha occurs between the end of M phase and the beginning of S phase, and G2 is on the other side of the circle, it's between the S phase and the M phase. And what these phases do is they're really um, responsible for allowing for time for the cell to duplicate a lot of its main uh, components besides DNA, not DNA. DNA is only in the S phase. So G1 and G2 is where the organelles are going to duplicate, it's where the cell membrane is going to duplicate, it's where we're going to get more cytoplasm. The cell is going to grow a lot in these two phases. The cell is also in this place monitoring the environment around it, monitoring what's inside the cell to ensure that the cell is prepared prepared for division. We're going to talk about this, the checkpoints in a couple of slides and how the cell cycle is controlled, but these are the um, two phases where things are checked out to make sure that we're, repa we're prepared to move on. Because we don't want to move into S or M phase unless everything is ideal for that to occur. The S phase is synthesis, and this is where the DNA replication occurs. And I'm not going to go into DNA replication because we've already spent a lot of time on DNA replication this semester, but if you want to review that, you can go back to Unit 2. Now, in humans, at the end of S phase, the cell is going to have twice as, much, um, twice as many chromosomes, so we're going to have 92 chromosomes at the end of S phase. And depending on the organism, though, the number is just going to be double whatever it normally is. So remember, from the end of S phase all the way up until cytokinesis, the cell now has double the DNA. M phase, this is the phase that you um, know as mitosis. And my M phase actually is mitosis and cytokinesis. It is both of these processes. And there's and it's only a very small section of time. It occurs really, really quickly, and it goes through the phases that we're going to review in topic two for this chapter. And the pro uh, the uh, product of M phase is two identical daughter cells, as you should know. And so that's what the pr purpose of M phase is. And we're going to go through all these in the next topic, because the next topic is dedicated to only to the M phase. 
All right, so how does the cell control this process? We've been talking about control all semester. We talk about all the feedback loops and everything. And it's important that we understand the cell doesn't just uncontrollably divide, unless we're talking about cancer cells or something that's gone wrong. And the cell cycle is controlled through a series of checkpoints. And you can see some of these checkpoints here on this slide. And what it is is that each of these times when the cell reaches the end of each of these phases, the checkpoint is either triggered or it's not, and it's a rest the cell cycle at that point. And it's really, really important that this cell does not move on until it's ready. And so that's why we have to have these checkpoints. Now something that's important to know is that G1 is the only one that's going to be triggered by, that can be triggered by environmental factors. G1 is the one that will say, is there enough nutrients in the environment? Is it, is it the correct environment? Is it should we put, be putting our energy into cell division? And so there's a lot of energy that goes into this process, and it's not something that the cell wants to go through light, or easily and quickly and just for the heck of it. They want to make sure that it's the right time for it. So let's look at how these um, checkpoints are triggered. So the cell cycle is controlled by something known as the CDK cyclin complex. The CDK is a cyclin-dependent kinase, and you can see that here on the slide. And cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs, they must be bound to a cyclin in order for them to become active. CDKs on their own are not active um, enzymes. Once they bind with the cyclin, though, they can become an activated complex through phosphorylation, stuff like that. We'll talk about that here in just a second. But for the moment, just accept that when they bind, they can become active. What these enzymes then do is they are responsible for very specific activities in each of those cells, um, each of those phases we just talked about. So they'll help um, coordinate the movement of organelles. They'll help do this. They'll help do that. And so that's what the cyclins are important for. And there are very specific cyclins for each checkpoint, and they exist for a very short time. So they're very active, short-lived, and specific. Okay. So how do we activate these, these CDKs in the cyclin complex? So as you can see here, we have our CDK, and it comes in and binds to the cyclin. Now, think about it. The cell has two ways of managing this initial binding, right? They can control the amount of cyclin present and the amount of CDKs present. Typically, you'll see that the amount of cyclin is what's controlled by the cell but it can manage both of them. And so it's really important to understand that by managing how much of those are present, they can inhibit the formation of this complex. And this is a way to stop the cell from cycling. So once these two come together, they form the cyclin CDK complex. Now, they're not active yet. They have to, this complex has to be phosphorylated. Now, for, the, for this process, though, when it first gets phosphorylated by a protein kinase, there's three phosphates that are put onto the uh, CDK. There's an activating phosphate, but there's two inhibitory phosphates. And these inhibitory phosphates still prevent the cyclin CDK complex from being activated. It's not until the phosphatase removes those inact inhibitory phosphates that the active cyclin CDK complex can go and do it what go and do what it needs to do. So, I mean, it's a little confusing because it gets phosphorylated and then dephosphorylated before it can become active. But it's important to understand how that works. All right, so not only can the cell control how CDKs are activated and when they're activated, but they can also inhibit CDKs, and this can be through a variety of inhibition signals. And as you can see here from this slide, there's a variety of things that could cause inhibition signals to be created. So we have damaged DNA, we have unfavorable extracellular environment, etc. You can see that here. So these uh, molecules, these inhibitors, will bind to the CDK cyclin complexes and will either cause them to break down or cause them to prevent to be phosphorylated or a variety of things. But what this does is it prevents the cell from continuing through the cycle until events are favorable again. And so not only do we have a lot of controls in how we activate CDKs, but we also have a lot of controls in how we inhibit CDKs. As you can tell, the cell is very, very invested in making sure that we do not go through the cell cycle unless it is necessary and right for the cell at the time. Now one more phase that we need to talk about before we move on to some example slides is the G0 phase.
Now, some cells don't go through the cell cycle at all. Once they've differentiated into the nerve cell, the heart cell, whatever they're going to be, they never will go through the cell cycle. In fact, they take apart all the machinery in their cell that would allow for this to happen. The cell doesn't produce cyclins, it doesn't produce CDKs, and that's important to know that not every cell goes through the cell cycle. A lot of the cells we talk about are more of our um, the cells that you think about that go through cell cycle, you know, skin cells, gut cells, things like that that reproduce. But a lot of our organs that you know are, once they're got damaged, they're damaged and we can't replace them or repair them, those are cells that are in G0 phase. Alright, so let's look at a couple examples of how CDK and cyclins work. In this example, we're talking about entering the S, the S phase. So what you can see here is we start out in our origin of replication and we have that origin replication complex. Remember that big complex of proteins we talked about back in unit two. In this case we have a CDK which is at CDC6 sitting on the origin of replication and this is the pre-replicative complex. And what this does is it somewhat, it helps recruit the components but it doesn't start it yet. Once the SCDK is activated it will trigger the other proteins and everything to show up and take it, that CDC6 apart so that then the rest of the replication can continue. So it sits there and it helps prevent it um, from occurring until SCDK triggers that that is no longer needed, breaks it down, and then we can move on to the assembly of the replication fork and completion of DNA replication. So this is an example of how SCDK works. Now remember I told you that each of the CDKs are really specific. They only do, um, they only work for certain phases. And there's a list of them in your book if you're interested, but they all just have specific ones. Let's look at how G1 phase is controlled from DNA damage though. So here's another example. So in this case, the cell is damaged. And so we don't want to go through G1 phase. We don't want the cell to cycle anymore. So the DNA is damaged and there's the activation of the protein kinases that will phosphorylate this protein known as P53. And P53 is responsible for inhibiting this process. So P53 gets phosphorylated. It binds to the regulatory region of a gene called P21. And then this P21 is going to get made and what this does is it's an inhi inhibitor protein that binds the G1SCDK or just the SCDK complexes and prevents the cell from continuing either into S phase or continuing out of S phase because of this DNA damage. So make sure you understand how that works. There's two, these last two examples, one was about how we move through the phase or how we move into one phase from another. This one's how we prevent moving from one phase to another. So this is the end of topic one. When you're ready, let's go ahead and move on to topic two where we're going to talk about all, where we're going to focus all the way on the, or only on the M phase.